All right, everyone, today we have Dez, a trainer from Intercom. We've actually had Karen Peacock on the show before. That's right. Um, so Intercom, good friends. Um, I'm, I'm actually going to talk about event sponsorships in a little bit because you guys have sponsored our conference before, <laughs> um, and you guys are pretty heavy on that. But can you tell everyone that maybe doesn't know Intercom um, kind of what you guys do and how you, I guess, your story, how you started it? Certainly. So Intercom helps internet businesses communicate with their customers. Uh, we are probably most known for being a messenger that you'll see inside software uh, on mobile apps and also on websites. We started Intercom because we had the problem ourselves. We actually had a different product called Exceptional. And Exceptional was a Ruby on Rails error tracker, real boring shit. Mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. and we had thousands of customers and we had never really met any of them and we had no easy way to talk to them. This was like in 2009. So there was like no Stripe, there was no like good supporting software for B2B SaaS in general. Uh, and I said there was no Stripe because the only record we had of our paying customers was actually a PayPal subscription log where we had to log in and download mm. an XML file, transfer the XML through an XSLT transform into a regular spreadsheet so that we could open up a spreadsheet, paste that spreadsheet into a different tool. We then synced that against our activity logs to see who was actually using the product and paying for it because we didn't want to mail people who weren't using it and get feedback from them because it was a waste of time. Yeah. So we'd go from there uh, to like get our final list of people we wanted to talk to, send them out an email through like MailChimp or Campaign Monitor or something like that from back then, and then get like 300 replies in our inbox in a really unstructured way. Uh, and it was a bit of a mess. Mm -hmm. And the core idea here was just like talking to our users was so hard and so important. And there was no good tooling for it. So it felt like there was an opportunity there. So one day inside the exceptional tool, we had this little speech bubble pop up. And it said something like, hi, we're the team behind Exceptional. What mm -hmm. should we work on next? Or something like that. And the, we got like thousands of replies instead of the maybe tens or hundreds of replies we would have gotten to the previous mm -hmm. uh, email attempt. Uh, because it turns out talking to somebody while they're using a tool gets you better feedback than emailing them three days later. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and all the replies were all the same thing. Nothing to do with Exceptional and everything to do with, this thing is cool. How did you send this little message to me? And we're like, oh. It's weird how like, it turned out that the thing we built inside of our product yeah. seemed to be more attractive to our customers than the product itself. Instant product market fit. So it seemed. Yeah. And the realization for us was like every single internet business, we thought it would maybe, maybe might have been just us because we're in Ireland, we weren't in Silicon Valley, we were quite uh, divorced from our users. There was like literally a street in San Francisco where we had more customers than we did in all of Ireland. Hmm. But actually it turns out everyone has this problem. Uh, and we started working on like, making this little tool better. And as it got better, we realized that not only does everyone have this problem, like, it's a big problem, and it's a problem people are willing to like, pay to solve. Mm -hmm. So we sold the other product, Exceptional. It went on to become a part of Rackspace. And then from there, we had this effectively lump of JavaScript that would help people connect to their users. Mm -hmm. Then we needed to build a whole company around it. Yeah. So, uh, so that became our kind of focus for like 2011. We, uh, we worked hard trying to basically make a company around the idea that you should talk to customers while they're using your product. And, uh, and we launched at the end of 2011 and uh, came out of beta in January 2012. We were just four people. Today, we're like 600 people. We're like five offices, like over 30,000 customers. It's obviously hit some sort of extreme product market fit along the way. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it, it, was, uh, it definitely had, a, had an interesting development. Got it. Okay. What kind of numbers can you share around the business? You gave customers, I think. Uh, over 30,000 customers. I don't know what the actual latest public figure is, but it's yep. over 30. Uh, revenue wise, we haven't shared anything recently. I can tell you that like um, a few years ago, we announced that we went from 1 million error to 50 million error in three years. Mm, I remember which that. very fast. Yeah. Uh, that, that's probably the most recent uh, thing we've shared on that. Um, I guess we power like, we've tracked, I think, one and a half billion people across the internet. Mm -hmm. We power like half a billion conversations a month. Yep. Um, and that, that, you know, generally speaking, the way to think about Intercom is like businesses talk to customers through Intercom. So the numbers we care about are like uh, end users, which is how many people have experienced Intercom mm -hmm. in the wild, uh, businesses, which is who's paying us, yeah. and then conversations that they have along the way. They're like they're the three like non-vanity metrics that we we kind of think are important to the success of the business. Got it. And, and how do you separate yourself from your competitors? Because you have competitors are moving very quickly, right? Mm -hmm. So how are you guys different? I think the we have always had this belief that you need to offer your customers a single way to talk to a business. Mm -hmm. And that any version of the world where it's like, this is the sales bot, come talk to the sales bot, but if you really want to talk to a human, go over here and use this other tool. 
I think it, it creates a really warped customer experience when you're like, you know, the age old experience here is businesses are so willing to talk to you right up until you start using their product and then they just want to minimize the cost and never talk to you again, right? Uh, we have invested in sort of saying, in, in this belief, which is that we are here to make internet business personal, which means we're as personal at the start of a relationship as we are at the end. It's the same tool from sales through to marketing, through to onboarding, through to support. And the customer record, obviously there's loads of business advantages when you have a single customer record for everything that ever happened to mm -hmm. Eric as he signed up for Intercom or whatever. But I think like it's we've had this belief that we we will serve all the communications. And I think the um, a lot of the copycats would, would take a very specific slice yeah. and they'll say, we're going to generate leads mm -hmm. or we're going to do website chat or whatever. But like that, that narrative quickly falls apart when the very second they log in, the messenger is no longer there because it turns mm -hmm. out you don't really care about your customers. You actually just care about leads. Mm. Or like uh, when you reach out to the lead and they reply to a different tool or, well, you know, it's, I think you need to have this <coughs> consistent singular way of talking to customers. I think that's what actually breeds the loyalty and sense. Like we'll often see messages like whenever I sign into a product and see Intercom, I know that they care. That's because that's actually what the representation is. It's like people who actually care about the customers tend to use Intercom. Mm -hmm. People who care about hacking a number or juicing a number, maybe they use a different tool. So you guys, <coughs> excuse me, you guys are the all-in-one, basically. Yeah, well, for for a certain segment of the market, we are literally yes. all-in-one. And then for people, maybe for larger businesses, yeah, what we offer is oftentimes we're like the the, the first line for most conversations. Yeah. And then yes, if something has to get super formal, it might go to Salesforce to record a deal. Yeah. It might go to Zendesk to record a formal ticket or a service yeah. cloud or something like that. But yeah, for a lot, a lot of startups, we are like we're like the single way they talk. That's literally what we do with, with, with our software. Literally, it's all in one. It's the CRM, it's everything. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's been amazing. Actually, a lot of people tell me that too. They use it as all in one. Um, so what's been working for you guys in terms of growth? I actually want to start with events. Yes. So why so many events? Uh, I think literally you guys have the biggest booths everywhere I go. Like yeah, SAS yeah. everywhere. So the way I... The way SAS I, doctor. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. The way I think about this is um, content is actually our thing. Mm -hmm. And content has many mediums. Uh, or media, I guess. Uh, so like I gave a presentation earlier. That presentation will be a blog post and it will be a podcast and it will be probably be a booklet or a book over time as well. Uh, and it's all because we've sort of believed that like Intercom carries or embodies a lot of these specific ideas. Like one of them is like, you know, you need to stick around for your customers after they sign up. And we have a whole product around that called Productors. Uh, we have a blog post about that, and we have a conference talk, and we have Ruby code that executes those things as well. Mm -hmm. And it's the same idea represented in many forms. Same as like, talk to the right customer at the right time in the right place. Uh, we have like, there's like lines of Rails that will, or Ruby that will execute that. There's a blog post, there's a conference talk, there's a book, and there's also us coming to the right place to talk to the right people about the right thing. And uh, so I think we've, we start with this idea of like core concepts and core ideas. And we look for ways in which we can deploy them. And sometimes that's an event, and we'll host an event, or we'll attend an event, or sponsor an event. We ran a world tour two years in a row a while ago, uh, and we also like will uh, you know we'll find any mean, mean, means we can to sort of share it. And so mm -hmm. that's I think a lot of it stems from just content. And then you know we're here ultimately because of the ideas we want to mm -hmm. share. Do you expect like an event like this? Do you expect to ROI on it immediately, or is it like over a period of time? Uh, definitely not immediately for two reasons. One is that we know the intercom is, is often uh, for larger companies it's a slower sell mm -hmm. because people don't overnight change their help desk. Uh, people will overnight change their like live chat for sales type tool. Uh, the reason they'll do that is because the history and legacy of those things doesn't matter. It's like mm -hmm. you know yesterday's customers or yesterday's news in that in that world. Yep. Um, but we know that like. Generally speaking, when we talk to larger businesses, the conversation we have isn't about like conversion rates or live chat channels. It's much more about like, here's how to think about your company as being customer centric and customer focused, and here's what that might look like, and here's the sort of companies like like yours have experienced effects like this: increase in loyalty, increase in LTV, decrease in churn, whatever, right? Yeah. Um, so, you, so surprise, surprise, somebody who takes a business card today doesn't sign up tomorrow. Yeah. It, there's a lot more going on. The second thing is, obviously, we don't realize LTV until like quite a long time. Intercom, yeah. like customers tend to stick around for a long mm -hmm. time. Uh, so I, I would say like, uh, you know, the first point at which we'd probably look at the ROI of something like this might be like maybe three months. That would, that would kind of give most businesses a chance to have a conversation with us, having internal conversations go to contract, et cetera. That's probably the first checkpoint we'd have, but I, I wouldn't say we'd be done calculating until maybe nine months. Got it. 
So you're sitting on a mountain of data right now. Actually, I was interviewing um, uh, Michael Litt from Vidyard a little earlier, yeah. and he gave a lot of video statistics, right? So around kind of conversational chat statistics, what can you share that you think would be interesting for everyone? Trending, et cetera. Uh, I, I, I'm not up on my conversational stats, I have to admit. Uh, like, all I, you know, we don't like, we're not in the data game in mm -hmm. that we don't sell data or look yeah. at data. The things I'd say that we see most is um, we have this product called AnswerBot. Mm -hmm. And what AnswerBot does is it looks at your most common questions and, and, and finds your highest rated answers. And what we've seen is like, uh, this, for starters, there's a direct relationship between product complexity and uh, an answer bot like being valuable. Like the more complex the product, the denser the questions you get, and, the, and the, often the self-similarity of the questions is quite high. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing we see is um, shocking results around. Like we have customers who have like reduced 25% of their entire customer support queries mm. by answering like 11 questions. And what's really interesting is Answerbot was able to tell them that that was that was what would happen in advance. It was like if we can come up with like a standard answer to these like eleven clusters, mm -hmm. we will uh, will reduce your your conversation cost, right? So I think like the the biggest probably repurposable insight is that in any non-trivial sort of SaaS product, I'd wager that there are like double-digit percentage amount of your conversations that are not value add, not brand building or relationship building. Sure. They are transactional simple requests that you are probably wasting human capital on. Uh, and and you're also wasting your customer's time because no human's going to reply immediately to everything. So like, you know, when, when we measure the success of Answerbot, we look at both how many teammate errors did we save, and how much of your customer support team time did we save, but also how many customer errors did we save. Like, mm -hmm. because we're able to give the answer in zero seconds, or we can actually at times we can predict the question before it even comes in. Uh, because we can answer that quickly, it's we get this beautiful fluidity of behavior. So the very second they think of something, they get the answer immediately and they keep going. Versus file a ticket, close the tab, go back to whatever else they're doing, mm. uh, which is the other behavior that we're trying to push away. So I think probably like the repurposable insight there is just this idea of like there's a there's a fat head and a long tail, and that fat head is definitely worth solving when you mm. analyze your conversational clusters. Got it. What is so this will go in another direction? What do you think is the biggest marketing fail you guys have had? Because I remember. Sometimes I'd see newspapers, sometimes yeah. I'd see like, everything's really well done, oh, right? Yeah, yeah. Any, anything that just went up in flames? I'd say like loads of little things and then like, I'll give you one big example at the end. Like, it's hard to measure, say like we did newspaper at Sastre, I think is that we referred to? Like, uh, it's hard to work out what, whether that was worth it or not. Mm -hmm. um, and it's hard to work it out because we know the Sastre sponsorship was worth it. Uh, we'll probably know the SaaS stock one's worth it. Yeah. But it's hard to measure the ROI down to the actual brand assets that we hand out on the stand. Yeah. Um, I could definitely say, like, you know, there is a fixed cost to doing any of these things, whether it's the book or the newspaper or whatever. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that can get quite high if you venture into a domain you don't know, like newspaper production, it turns yeah. out, is more complicated than you realize. Yeah. Uh, shock horror. <laughs> um, and uh, so I, I think in, in those areas, I, I think there's no, there's no version of event where we can claim victory, and I mm -hmm. could make some reasoned arguments as to why it didn't work. Yep. But uh, we, regardless, we don't have to, we don't have the full set uh, of information. Yeah. I think um, we've had like, for our second world tour, we had like a kickoff event in Dublin uh, where like honestly the content wasn't ready. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, we we didn't charge in. We gave all the money to charity, uh, but like it was a real sort of uh, sort of smack in the head of like shit. That was not good. You yeah. know, and uh, and like that felt like a big fail. Because uh, it's live and you can't you, you can't do it you, you can't like the same way you can update a landing page pretty quickly you can't mm -hmm. rerun an event mm -hmm. right you get your iteration cycle is years you know um, so that that was a challenge and then like I think for a long time we were pretty slow to react to, to this thing called marketing in general I'll give the biggest example of an absolute bang your head off a wall failure for me was we launched a product called Acquire in 2000 and I think 14 or 15 it was I like, remember yeah, yeah. and. Basically, we had this beautiful landing page, this really well curated sign up flow, everything. We, and for like a good five hours, we thought we had pulled this launch off to perfection. And then I got one message in which said, Hey, Des, current customer here, how do I sign up for Acquire? And I'm like, Oh, we had not yet worked out, we had not designed an onboarding plot for our existing customers. Because mm. somehow we'd left that aside in the middle of all our thinking. I went to look at the docs to see if there's an easy way to do this. Turns out we hadn't documented it either. Uh, and I think that was 
a time when we were obsessed with the new and the sort of shiny and the like, let's just do amazing things for the public, mm -hmm. not realizing we had like tens of thousands of people inside our product who also we should have been thinking about. Duh. Uh, and it totally, like, yeah. but like, I think that's what happens when you, um, like at the time, everything we thought about marketing, we didn't understand the function of customer marketing. We just thought about marketing as being this thing that you do to the world uh, to get people into your product. We never mm -hmm. realized we had to market to our own customers. So that was a mistake that like probably cost us like months of work and probably like I don't know like I can't estimate the revenue back there from back then but like let's say it was like at least hundreds of thousands if not more of right. like of what should have been instant hit right. turned out to be like something where we we went from like celebrating a launch to literally putting the champagne back on ice and mm. scrambling to try and make this work. Yeah. What do you think current does right now would tell maybe early days that Intercom CEO does? Knowing uh, everything that you know now. Sure. Well, uh, I'm not the CEO. I'll clarify that. Uh, okay. I'm the chief strategy officer. Co-founder. Uh, yeah, co-founder. Co-founder yeah. is good. Um, do you mean like what, what, what would I say from a point of view of like to, Your experience. Yeah, to try and help that person yeah. kind of move faster, perform yeah. better? Um, when you're hiring in areas you don't understand, you need to do like not just twice the due diligence that you might on an area. Like, So I, I know how to hire designers, let's say, right? Mm -hmm. I can look at work and I can talk to them or whatever. Um, and you might think, well, you're trying to hire a marketer, you should do like twice the work. I actually think the ratio is more like 10 to 15 times mm. the work. And I, I, I think like, I've learned the hard way that you shouldn't be trying to make senior hires in roles until you really feel like you could have a good go at that role yourself. You know, like you really need to not be able to be, you know, you need to have an opinion about what you actually think uh, how you think this should happen. So how, how should Intergram be marketed or sold or mm -hmm. how should financing work or whatever the hell, right? Like you really need to like know enough about it to have an opinion, know enough about it to not be like uh, blinded by a resume in some sense mm -hmm. uh, and know enough about it to uh, to be able to like back the, uh, and support and give the right support and context to somebody when they start in that role. Mm -hmm. I think that was probably like, if I could like tweak any dial, I think that's probably what it would be. It would be like, get me better at the areas I don't understand so that I can make better moves there. So 10 to 15x more time on research. On research, on things you don't understand, but mm -hmm. but you might get the illusion of thinking you understand because you read a few blog posts. Like yep. like if you, if I told you you need to hire like a SVP of growth tomorrow, you mm -hmm. might go and read, uh, well growth is probably a bad example for you, but like uh, you might go and read like a few blog posts and talk to your friend and yeah. your friend's gone and then, hey, I heard blah, 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 has got a great growth function. You should talk to them. And you might be like, all right, I've read the blog post. I've read a half a book. Mm -hmm. I talked to my friend and I talked to one growth leader. Yep. Now I'm good to go. I would yeah. say you're now good to start your research. Yeah. And that's the difference. It's that order of magnitude. Yeah. Okay. Love it. Yeah. Uh, what is one tool you'd recommend that is not intercom to, to everyone? So it could be like a Peloton bike or it could be an app, something like that. Hmm. That's a good question and not one I expected. I would say um, the tool I find most rewarding in my life uh, is Strava, mm. the running app. I've got to add you. Oh, you should, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, and likewise. Um, and the reason I like Strava is like I'm not like I'm not an exercise fanatic or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But every social network I use is basically people posting scorpy shit, <laughs> nasty shit, coming up with the best hot take to take down some company. Uh, and then everyone else retweeting and being like, yeah, we took that person down. Yeah. Oh, isn't that guy an idiot or whatever, right? Yeah. And, and it's all this vicious cycle of like negative feedback. Mm. And then in the middle of it all, there is Strava where I do something healthy yeah. that I can't lie about. I can't yeah. pretend to have done. I have to actually do it Yeah. because uh, Strava will know. Yeah. And all my friends say, good on you. And yeah. then I load the, uh, the uh, Strava app and I scroll. I see all my friends doing healthy shit that's good too. And, and you're I'm, liking and, it too. And yeah. I like that. And then I'm inspired yeah. to go and do that. And it's like the only, probably the only positive feedback cycle yeah. in my life. Uh, yeah. I, I, true technology, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Where like, I'm just like, I just genuinely think this encourages good behavior and yeah. it's a good thing for the world. And sadly, that's probably why it's not like a Twitter sized success or whatever, because like you know, it turns out the demand for it is like lower. Yeah. But that's probably like, and I know it's not like, ooh, I've got some obscure tool you've yeah. never heard of type answer. But like, that's probably the one where I'm like, yes, I actually think this is a force for good yeah. in the middle of a sea of maybe not forces for good or for forces of debatable good. I never yeah. thought of it that way. That's helpful. Yeah. What's, what's your screen name for everyone? Does that yeah, trainer. trainer on there? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Add me too, Eric and Sue. <laughs> uh, okay. Final question. What is one must read book you recommend to everyone? Uh, I'll give you two. Sure. Uh, there's a short book, which is, let me give you a long book first. The long book is How Will You Measure Your Life by Clay Christensen. Mm -hmm. And I think that book is one that kind of had a personal and professional effect on me. It's a really, really, really good book. 
He basically, Clay Christensen's the father of a load of business theories, most of which are true, some of which are debatable. Uh, but he applies them all to his personal life and talks about how things like, oh, like raising kids or getting married or settling down or picking your career or planning your education are all like, they're all huge decisions that are worthy of some analysis, the same way you might analyze uh, decisions you make in your professional life. And, um, and I think the challenge uh, a lot of people do is because a lot of these decisions, like who you love or like, or like what you want in life, they can be feel so good and intu intuition based that you tend to not necessarily um, like think them true. And that's fine when it works out well, mm. but oftentimes you can find yourself going down a slippery slope of like marginal gains. And, uh, and I think that book is a good kind of like slap around the head that kind of says, yo, like that extra drink or like that, that junk food habit or like this thing you're doing or like those negative tweets or whatever, they're not, they're actually a road to a bad place and mm -hmm. you don't realize it because it feels like one tiny step. Yep. And I think that that's the kind of the, the core, I'd say thrust of the book, but I, I, I have to say I was quite affected by that book. I thought it was really, really powerful. The other one is a book by Paul Arden and he wrote a, a couple of books. One of them was Whatever You Think, Think the Opposite. But I can't remember the one I actually want to recommend, which is his yeah. best selling book. Um, it's got some, it has some grandiose title, like you can do anything you want or something like that, <laughs> right? Uh, but it's a, it's a really short book, really punchy. It's like mm -hmm. really nicely illustrated. And, uh, and I swear to God, I'll, I'll come back to you with the name of it so you All can right. add it to the show notes. Yep. But uh, it's, a, it's, it's a beautiful short book for, the, for like just reminding people uh, that they actually have more potential in them than they realize. And, uh, and it sounds like a classic self-help book, but it, and it is in some sense. But thank you. It's not how good you are, it's how good you want to be. Thank you very <laughs> much, sir. Uh, that's the book I'm trying to recommend. It's not how good you are, it's how good you want to be. Yeah. And it's a reminder of the ability of potential, ambition, and desire, and how you can actually, you can bend the world around what you want uh, if you're willing to like, kind of will it into existence or work hard enough on it. And, uh, and I, I felt like it's such a short read that the ROI of it's quite high for most people. Love it. Well, Des, this has been really good. What's the best way for people to find you online? Just Des Trainer. Uh, people often mistake it as Destroyer, but it's just D E S T R A Y N O R. I love yeah. that. All right, everyone, cool. let's give Des a hand. Thank you. Take care.